This is the lecture for European history for Friday, the 29th of April, 2022. And we have reached a pivotal year. In 1934, Hitler had uh, succeeded Paul von Hindenburg not only as chancellor, which he already was, but as the effective president. But Hitler abolishes the office of president and becomes der Führer. Now, Führer, F-U-E-H-R-E-R, -E is German for leader. Now, this is typical. Stalin is called Bush. Is there a better way of saying that? Bush. Bush. Yeah, I, I think I think you said it right. Okay, and to my understanding, that means boss. If there's a better way, I'm happy to learn it. Okay, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> so Stalin's the Bosch. And, uh, of course, you've got Il Duce, which is uh, the Duke, that's Mussolini. And uh, in Spain, ultimately, Francisco Fa Franco will be called El Caudillo. And a Caudillo is sort of a military leader. So all of these guys <clears throat> have a special title. Der Führer is obviously the, the, the you know, it's, it's the Nazi one. And what it deals with is a Nazi double plus good simplification of language. You don't need a word beyond leader if he's the leader. And so people begin calling him Mein Führer, Mein Führer, like your majesty, like all, you know, the, the old Kaiser used to love being called all highest of all things. Uh, and he, he tried this stuff in front of his grandmother, Queen Victoria, when she was still alive, all highest. She laughed. <laughs> she, no, shut up, Willie. <laughs> You're my grandson. I'm going to call you Willie. Uh, oh, he didn't like that, but she was grandma. Um, and she was tough. Don't mess with Queen Vic. <laughs> so Mein Führer is how people begin to address Hitler, <clears throat> which is an imperial title, regardless of the name, the leader or my leader. Um, it is a title that does not have a constitutional description because it is, <laughs> it's not a constitutional office. It's beyond that. It's a transcendent title. Just like the powers, uh, the emergency powers granted for Hitler after the Reichstag fire, place his actual power beyond constitutional limits. This is a, an open recognition of that. So in 34, there is a famous <clears throat> Nazi party rally. Famous, I mean, they have these rallies all the way up till World, till World War II. But in 1934, you have the party really building up the fact that it is the national party that leads so massive resources are put into it. And there is a movie made by Lena, no, Ellie, Ellie Riefenstahl. Ellie Riefenstahl, the Nazis, like the communists, are great for sexual liberation. Uh, she is a uh, female directrix, I guess you'd call it, if you want to be modern. She's a director. Uh, and uh, Riefenstahl uh, films the Nazi party rally in Nuremberg in 1934. And can you get the shades, please? I guess what I will do is show you a little bit, assuming I can get it on YouTube, which I haven't censored, censored it yet, of Triumph of the Will. Now, Goebbels, who is the poison dwarf, the little sharp elf-like figure, that is Hitler's propaganda minister, never liked Riefenstahl and never liked this movie because he thought that it was way too blatant. Good propaganda should be somewhat subtle. <laughs> His propaganda later in the war isn't so subtle, but... Um, so Goebbels didn't like it. Hitler thought it was fine. And what you're going to do is you're going to get a sense of 
uh, the party and how it operates. And of course, I've got to pause because even though I'm using a YouTube video, God forbid I violate somebody's copyright. Oh, before I leave, oh, <laughs> I'll tell you, my own personal belief is that copyright should be 50 years, 50 years, and only 50 years, and that after 50 years, it's public domain. No more Bram Stoker estate running Dracula. No more Disney running Mickey, the, Mickey Mouse. No, none of this. 50 years is enough time to profit from your creation, and after that, public domain. But nobody listens to me, so there we go. There we go. Okay, the Nuremberg Laws on Race, 1935, is the legal basis for what will later become known as the final solution. But it's more than that. It's a reorientation of German society and a redefinition of German citizenship. In the Nuremberg Laws, race is defined. Now, Judaism is not just a religion. It's an ethnic group. And it is the ethnic group that the Nazis are trying to deal with. How do you determine who's a Jew and who is not? Well, they go to the American South, to the Jim Crow laws. How do you determine who's black and who's not? Well, after the Civil War, American Southern politicians, all of them Democrats, decide that uh, anyone with a Jewish, I'm sorry, anyone with a Negro uh, grandparent is going to be affected to some degree by the Jim Crow laws. So if you have a single black grandparent, you're part black, and that's going to change your legal status. So taking from this American example, uh, the Nazis who write the Nuremberg laws say that anyone who has a Jewish grandparent has a status as a Jew, at least to some extent. And if you have two Jewish grandparents, three Jewish grandparents, uh, your rights go lower and lower and lower. Jews are stripped of citizenship. They become subjects of the right, not citizens. Their right to vote, their right to hold office, their right to serve in the military, their right to have government jobs, their right to remain teachers, their right to be doctors, to Gentile patients. All of these are stripped. Jews are also stripped of their right to hold as much property as they can. They have a maximum limit on the amount of property or assets that they can control. And each year, the amount of assets that Jews are going to be allowed to control gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, you can say many things about Hitler, but one of the things you can't say is that he was financially corrupt. He didn't need to be. He got gifts, and as the leader, he basically got whatever he wanted. But his close followers, oh, they were financially corrupt. And um, as the Nuremberg Laws made it impossible for Jews to hold on to their homes, their assets, their businesses, um, they were put up for auction in many cases. But if anyone found out that a senior Nazi party official was bidding, everyone else would back the heck off. Because if you bid against a Nazi party leader and win... It won't be good. <laughs> no, they'll make you pay. So let's say you have a mansion that's worth a million Reichmarks. Jew has to sell it. Can't control that mansion anymore. So the Nazi, if he's feeling generous, might pay 10,000 Reichmarks for a one million Reichmark mansion. If he's feeling generous. Because no one's going to bid against him. So the property that Jews hold in Nazi Germany is stripped from them bit by bit. Their ability to live in certain areas is stripped from them bit by bit. If a Jew, a Jewish man, is found alone in a room with a Gentile woman, he might have to demonstrate that he did not rape her. I'll say that again. He has to prove, he might have to prove a negative that he did not rape her, because the presumption is that a Jewish man alone with a Gentile woman can't control himself. Proving someone did something is the way our justice system works. You're innocent until proven guilty, but in this case, you are guilty. You are presumed guilty unless you can absolutely demonstrate your innocence. So Jews begin to be plucked 
from the various places that they inhabit in society. Now, Jews with money go overseas. They have to give up almost their entire portfolio to do so, but they get the hell out if they can. But a lot of people prefer to live in Egypt, the land of denial, which makes them like a Parisian who falls into their river, insane. What that means with the lousy puns is that the capacity of human beings for self-delusion is epic. And there were many Jews that denied what they were seeing, that they were slowly being made into unpersons, that their legal rights were being stripped, that they were being taken out of the world of people around them, which they were. But it wasn't only Jews. <clears throat> it was also people with genetic disorders, people who were mentally handicapped, uh, anyone who wasn't a full Aryan or a majority Aryan. Oh, no new marriages between Jews and non-Jews, and the old marriages are going to be called into question. So, one of the results of the Nuremberg Laws, let's see if I can find this, is laws that restrict the ability of mentally defectives to have children, forced sterilization. Yeah, I've got time. This scene is from a movie called Judgment at Nuremberg that depicts the war crimes trials after World War II. This is going to be the testimony of a man who was identified as mentally defective and what happened to him as a result of the Nuremberg Laws. It is a dramatization, but it is closely based on fact and the laws they're referencing. The policies are quite factual. Oh, zap the video again, maybe bye. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.